Hello, welcome to the March 17th um, a regular meeting of the Glendale Arts and Culture Commission. Can we do roll call? Commissioners Tufankian? Here. Vidor? Here. Zadorian? Here. Vice Chair Vayar? Here. Chairperson Yink? Here. Agenda item 1A, report of the record reposting the agenda. The agenda for the March 17th, 2022 regular meeting was posted on March 14th on the bulletin board outside of City Hall. Agenda item 2A, minutes of the February 17th, 2022 regular meeting of the Arts and Culture Commission. Uh, if there are no corrections, I move to, I would like to move the minutes. Second. Thank you. Roll call commissioners to thank you. I wasn't there, so I would have to. Excuse. Abstain. Yeah. Um, uh, commissioners Vidor. Here. Uh, sorry. <laughs> yes. Zadorian. Yes. Vice chair Vyar. Yes. Chairperson Yink. Yes. Thank you. Agenda item 2B, minutes of the March 3rd, 2022 special meeting of the Arts and Culture Commission. I would like to move the minutes. Second. Thank you. Commissioners Tufankian? Yes. Vidor? Yes. Zadorian? Yes. Vice Chair Vyar? Yes. Chairperson Yink? Yes. Thank you. Agenda item 3A, Library Arts and Culture Events presented by Jennifer Fukutomi Jones, Principal Library Arts and Culture Administrator. I'm going to share my screen. Happy Women's History Month. <laughs> On March 21st, in honor of Black History Month, Women's History Month, and Rosie the Riveter Day, Glenda Library Arts and Culture has created special displays at all eight sites with images of African-American Rosie the Riveters, paying tribute to the many women who entered the workforce during World War II. Bookmarks of these images will also be available, and for more information, please visit the link on the screen. In honor of Women's History Month, Korean-American performance artist Jamie Soon Woo illustrates an American women's suffrage movement steeped in with inequality in her film Equality Tea. She shines a light on the dark history of Western tea consumption and recognizes the disenfranchisement within the suffrage movement. She acknowledges the many women of color that have spoken up for women's rights, for women's suffrage, and for equality. You can watch the film by clicking on the link below. Um, and as part of Women, Women's History Month, come and learn more about the life, work, and legacy of Dolores Huerta. Learn more about her struggles to eliminate pesticides from many of the same crops that end up in your cup of tea. Learn how topics such as intersectionality, gender, ethnic bias, social justice, activism, and advocacy collide in the life story of this iconic woman and the lives of those she touched. The discussion will premiere on GLAC's YouTube channel on March 29th at 5 p.m. On March 26th at 10.30 a.m., join Glendale Library Arts and Culture and Glendale native Paul R. Ignatius as he talks about Glendale in the 1920s and 30s. Paul Ignatius is the former Secretary of the Navy from 1967 to 1969 and was born in Glendale. He attended Hoover High School where he served as both the student body president in 1938 and continued his education at USC where he graduated Phi Beta Kappa. He would later serve as Assistant Secretary of the United States Army, Under Secretary of the United States Army, um, uh, Navy, I'm sorry, and Under President Lyndon B. Johnson. The event will take place in person at Central Library, and for more information, please visit the link on the screen. On March 19th at 10.30 a.m., as part of the music animated series, USC Kazan Taiko will perform an estimated 45-minute concert. The performance will be outside on the Brand Library Plaza. Seating is first come, first served, and we encourage you to arrive early. Capacity is limited. Also, as part of the music series on April 2nd at 2 p.m., join the award-winning virtuoso duo Jaga, which consists of clarinetist Leslie Ferreria and guitarist Jackson Williams. They have performed in North America, South America, and Europe. And on April 30th at 2 p.m., join Bok Young Byun, who will, perform, who will perform a solo guitar recital. She won in many international competitions and awards, and most recently won the 2021 Guitar Foundation of America International Concert Artist Competition. 
probably the most prestigious guitar competition in the world. For more information, please see the link on the screen. Glendale Library Arts and Culture and the Reflect Space Gallery are proud to present As the Earth Wanes, Considering Climate Change. This exhibition is designated to reflect on the effects of global warming and climate change on our planet. Artist Luciana Albay contributes a large scale conceptual installation reflecting on the fragility and vulnerability of our planet. Anna, Anna Anne Johansson presents photographs and research from across the globe addressing the causes and impacts of climate change. And artist Elk Penn, in a special collaboration with the City of Glendale Public Works Department, contributes drawings and posters from coexisting Glendale Tree Stories, a public story sharing project that seeks to elevate, celebrate, and archive residents' shared stories and histories and relationships to urban forests. Elpen's project is made possible with the support of from Cal Humanities, a partner of the National Endowment for the Humanities. This exhibit will be on display from March 19th to May 21st, 2022. For more information, visit the link on the screen. And last up, Glendale Libraries and Culture and the Brand Library are proud to present Mapping the Sublime. This exhibit features Los Angeles-based artists Lawrence Geip and Beth Davila Waldman, who organized a survey of diverse group of 19 artists that challenge our culture's entrenched conceptions regarding landscape, critically re-examining the genre as a meditative view of nature and a construction of centuries of aesthetic processing, demarcation, and colonial expansion. The works persuade the viewer to consider the landscape genre anew, with, tradition, with traditional notions of the sublime reevaluated to reflect contemporary issues of climate change. <clears throat> of climate change, the artists featured may have com have made compelling cases over decades of practice and passion for an issue that needs to be faced as an ever growing urgency. The exhibit will be on display from April second to June eleventh, twenty twenty two, and for more information, you can visit the link on the screen. And that is it for the library report. Um, Commissioner Yankme, or Chairperson Yankme, move the agenda forward? Yes. Okay. okay. Agenda item four, oral communications. We do not have any at this time. Um, uh, agenda item 5A, nomination of one commissioner to the Artist Review and Selection Committee for the Creative Crosswalks RFP. Motion appointing one commissioner to the Artist Review and Selection Committee for the Creative Crosswalks RFP. Uh, this is specifically in regards to Exhibit A that was attached into your packet uh, in regards to the Creative Crosswalks RFP. We also have um, Sarkis Oganesian, who's the Acting Deputy Director of Public Works, who's also here to, to answer any questions that you may have regarding this. But this specifically is an agenda item for the nomination of a commissioner to the Artist Review and Selection Committee for the Creative Crosswalks RFP, um, specifically who would be reviewing the proposals for this project. <clears throat> Chair Yang? Um, yes. Uh, Gary Schaefer, Director, Library Arts and Culture. Uh, Jen, where will these uh, be located? There are three project locations. One of them is uh, Adams Square and Palmer Avenue. The second location is uh, Broadway and the Gallery Away, and the third is also Broadway, and I don't have it up with me right now, but I can pull it up, but there are three specific projects. Okay, so if anyone has a conflict of interest with any of those areas, then they probably would not want to stand for that. So anyway, thank you. Um, I'm happy to, <clears throat> to nominate myself uh, for this review committee. Uh, unless there's, if there's other commissioners who would be interested, happy to hear that as well. Great, let's, I'll make a motion to appoint commissioner, I'm sorry, chair Yank to the uh, selection committee. Is that what we're calling it? Let me look at the. I'll second that nomination. The RFP nomination. Thank you. Um, I can do a roll call. Commissioner Stufankian. Yes. Vidor? Yes. Zadorian? Yes. Vice Chair Vayar? Yes. Chairperson Yank? Yes. Thank you. 
Uh, agenda item 5B, Armenian Genocide Remembrance Monument, motion recommending to the City Council to approve the acceptance and installation of the proposed monument in recognition of the Armenian Genocide by the Consulate General of Armenia to be located at the Central Library 222 East Harper Street. And we have Christine Powers here who is going to present a presentation on that. Good afternoon, uh, Chairperson Yang, Commissioners and staff. Um, as Jennifer noted, I am Christine Powers from the City Manager's Office. I am going to take you through the newly adopted public monument um, policy quickly before um, I go into the actual request itself. So I'm going to share my screen with you in just a second. Okay. Um, okay, can you all see that? No. No? Okay, give me one second. Jennifer, do you mind? Sure, I can. Actually, I'm sorry, give me one more second. It's showing up now. Okay. Are you seeing it in presentation mode? No, we can see the slides. Okay, there we go. There we go. Okay. I'm sorry, give me one more second. Jennifer, do you mind doing it from your end? Sure, let me let me pull because that up. I'm, my apologies, commissioners. some technical difficulties today. There we go. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So um, on the next slide, you will see an overview of the public monument and memorial plaque policy that council just adopted at the beginning of this month. It um, is made up of two parts, public monuments and memorial plaques. And uh, council, um, our city manager actually asked for a policy because we had a couple of public monuments that were coming to the city. Um, and additionally, we had no uh, formalized process of dealing with memorial plaques. And so this policy addresses both of those things. Uh, public monuments, as you can see, those requests come into the city manager, um, which is why I'm here presenting this before you today. The proposals would go to the Arts and Culture Commission for recommendation. They would also go to the Parks, Rec, and Community Services Commission if the proposed location of the monument is at a parks facility. And then it ultimately goes to council for approval. Uh, memorial plaques, just so you know, I won't go into these, but the applications go directly to the Director of Community Services and Parks, and any appeals of those are made to the Parks, Recreation, and Community Services Commission. Next slide, please, Jennifer. So the general guidelines of public monuments, um, these establish the criteria and process and placement of monuments um, sponsored by individuals or groups on city property. Once a monument or a memorial plaque is approved, it would become property of the city of Glendale. And by accepting and placing and publicly displaying these um, privately funded and donated monuments, the city, the city deems these as an expression of government speech. And so any accepted monument is meant to convey a government message and is not for the purpose of providing a forum for public speech. As such, any request promoting violence or hatred against individuals or groups based on attributes as defined in the policy that is included as part of your report uh, will not be permitted. Additionally, monuments shall be limited to a single representation per person or event commemorated to avoid any sort of duplication. Next slide, please, Jennifer. Thank you. So in general, monuments are defined as memorial statues, objects, or installation of any permanent materials that are there to commemorate individuals, groups, events, or concepts. Um, they must have an identifiable connection to the history, cultural makeup, or identity of the city. 
Um, and generally speaking, if a monument is for a person, it would not be for living persons, and we would want a minimum of five years from the um, from the passing of that person, or if it's for an event, from the conclusion of that event, just to give you that perspective of time. Um, and should there ever be a desire to make a case to um, for an event or a person within that five year time frame or a living person, um, then the applicant would just need to state why they would they feel that that's important. Um, next slide, please. And so for the approval of monuments, the consideration of criteria that is outlined in the policy um, is shown here. The final, um, you would have to look at appropriateness, compatibility, the impact of use on public space, the aesthetics, any maintenance and insurance that the uh, piece would need, and as well as safety. And you can see the process there that it would go to Arts and Culture Commission. Again, should it need, should it be in a park space, it would go to the Parks Commission and then ultimately to City Council. And then after this process, one City Council um, approves a proposed monument. The final approval for installation won't occur until the applicant has entered into a written agreement with the city. Um, and the applicant will pay all costs associated with the, with the design, fabrication, placement, permitting, site preparation, and installation of a monument. And then after it's approved and installed, the city would pay for all basic maintenance. But if there's any you know, refurbishment for a particular art piece, or any um, additional maintenance that goes above and beyond graffiti removal and just your general cleanup, then um, that group can enter into a separate agreement with the city as we've done for the Comfort Women statue when um, they wanted it refurbished. Next slide, Jennifer. So that at this point is the, um, that is the policy in and of itself. I can go through the entire presentation and answer any questions then or I can stop here if you have any questions about the policy in general. I think we can proceed if there's okay. no immediate questions from any of the Great. commissioners. Sure, so the proposed monument that you have before you for consideration um, came by way of the Consulate General of Armenia in Los Angeles. They had reached out with a request to donate a monument in recognition of the Armenian genocide to the city of Glendale. The proposed monument is a stone sculpture of the forget-me-not flower, which has become a symbol of the memory of the 1.5 million victims of the Armenian genocide perpetrated by the Ottoman, Ottoman government. And the renderings um, that were included in your report are shown here. The monument would be produced by Stone Service, which is a company overseas in Armenia that creates these monuments and the Consul General would like to have this monument erected um, here to strengthen Armenian American relations and to have a memorial for Armenian genocide victims. Next slide, please. So this is what the monument would look like ideally, and this would be the second monument of its kind. The first of which was created and erected in Israel and the Armenian community of Israel um, did they um, they erected this in, for the 105th anniversary of the Armenian genocide, and the uh, the city there provided a space in their community park, um, and the monument went up in January of 2020. And the next photo shows you what their monument looks like at night. And then, so at the next slide will show you the proposed location um, of the monument. So in here, you can see that we are suggesting this concrete space just outside of the library entrance. Um, but upon further reflection and evaluation, the recommendation is to move it to the planter that's directly to the right of this space. The consulate did have some specific requests, but ultimately left the siting of the monument um, generally to the city. Um, it should be noted that the proposed monument, as they would like it to be, would have a base of eight and a half feet wide um, and about six feet tall. And the overall footprint of the monument, including the planter that surrounds the actual stone flower, would be about 14 to 15 feet in diameter. Now, that um, planter right there does measure 22 and a half feet along the sidewalk and then it goes 37 feet back before 
um, you get to the library building. And it should be noted that the size and scale can be modified to fit whatever the ultimate space is, but we feel that it would be appropriate at that scale given, um, given that location. Um, the nice thing about this location is that it is right outside the library. We have the reflect space right inside, which is a room dedicated to um, highlighting human rights violations. And then it also is the terminus of Artsakh Avenue. So the next slide kind of goes into what we were just talking about as far as the appropriateness of the monument based on the policy that council adopted. Um, it is appropriate in that the context is sensitive to the community and that it is suitable for all ages. The scale and design does seem compatible with the space. And as I mentioned, it ties into the adjacent reflex space in Artsakh Avenue. It is set back from the sidewalk, so it doesn't impact any existing right of ways. It will be constructed of a high quality stone. And um, as we mentioned, the height and width seem appropriate. The requester will meet um, the policy requirements as far as and the insurance is only one while the um, when, while the item is being built or brought in um, is when we would need that. And the design doesn't pose any obvious uh, safety standards. Um, with that, that concludes my report. I am happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you so much. Hey, uh, Jennifer, do you want to go through the roll call and then we can um, address any any questions you might have? Sure. Uh, Vice Chair Fire. I don't have any questions. Thanks. Uh, Commissioner Tu Feng Kim. Um, is this for questions? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes, I do have some questions. Um, I guess first I would want to uh, clarify what is the distinction between a monument and a sculpture? I'm sorry, could you repeat that question one more time, Commissioner Tufinkin? What would be the difference between a monument and a sculpture? And could a sculpture be, um, be a monument as well? Yes, to answer your question, a um, sculpture can certainly um, be a monument. Um, there are monuments such as if you look outside of City Hall, the Veterans Memorial, that is considered a monument, but less a sculpture because it's a big marble slab. But this one is does have an artistic um, expression, and so it, it would qualify as a sculpture. The policy doesn't attempt to define um, whether it's an artistic piece or not, but if it is in commemoration of a person or an event, then it falls under a public monument um, under the policy. Okay. And um, is there an art, who is the artist? From what we've been told, there isn't a specific artist. It just seems that the company who created this, they, their company designed this. There is no specific okay. artist name that we've been provided. I mean, it's a beautiful design. I was just wondering if, you know, could be something that um, could be an art piece and a monument. Um, and then I also have some questions about, um, you said it's a, um, a strong stone, I think. Do you know what stone is going to be used? We don't know at this time. They haven't specified the stone. Okay. And um, the first image, I think, the, um, let's see, where is it? I think it's page, uh, page six. So there's this sharp kind of uh, cone protruding out of the center of the, um, the sculpture. And then the following image does not have that. And I think that one has the light coming through. Do you know which one? This would be? I believe it would look like the one that is in Israel, Commissioner Tufenkin. So it wouldn't, okay. so it would have the um, kind of the raised cone, but not the spike necessarily, but. Not the spike. So it would be the light. Okay. Um, and then also, I wanted to see um, the proposed location. Would we have to get rid of any trees to put it there or? 
I believe there is one smaller tree that we might need to move. Okay. But we would move it. Okay. All right. That's it for me. Thank you. Commissioner Vidor. Um, yes, thank you. Um, and thank you, Christine, for that um, presentation. Really appreciate it and pr appreciate hearing about the new policy. Um, uh, just a couple questions. Did you, you said that it's going to be lit up at night? It, it could be lit up at night. The one that um, we haven't we've seen in Israel has those lights. And so that is something that um, we can have it lit at night. Mm hmm. It seems like it, you know, um, and anything that is a work of art, quote unquote, um, it's nice to have it lit up at night. So it's noticeable, um, I guess, uh, to to uh, Commissioner Tufenkian's point, this is, if I understand, identical to the piece in Israel, correct? And so do could I understand that there will be more um, versions of this um, made for other countries? Because it seems like it it's it's something that's being sort of produced by a company and they have a pattern and is the plan to have this exact same sculptural piece in other places? Do you know that? Uh, Commissioner Bedore, that's the sense that I get um, is that they would hope to have this in other places, but they really wanted to come to Glendale as a city that has, you know, the largest army and sure. diaspora per capita. Sure. I think it was important for them to attempt to establish one here. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then um, another question that I have is related to the base um, in looking at the uh, Israeli version. It looked to me, um, could you describe the base that's going to hold this thing? Because that base looked very disproportionately, um, I don't know how to put it exactly, like kind of clunky for lack of a better word. Uh, so I have questions about the base relative to the work itself and also to the idea or concept of a planter around it because you know, I, I think that the scheme of planting in and around the library is very beautiful and drought tolerant and has a very strong theme. And although forget-me-nots are is is the thing that uh, is being portrayed here, um, I'm not entirely sure it would be aesthetically appropriate to try to make a flower bed around it um, and to use more of the scheme that is already in place. Um, so those are my comments. I think that was about it. So I'll let you answer that. I would just say that the would be the base in the planter, the base in the planter. And that is certainly feedback that the commission can take forward to council if you feel that the base can be minimized a little bit um, and that the flowers around the statue or the sculpture would um, reflect the, the plants that you have currently around the library. I think they're amenable to those things, the, the group that is um, you know, the Consul General's office, they are amenable to some of those things. Thank you. Director Schaefer, did you have? I think you're on mute. All right, we can't hear you. Thank you. Then good. I didn't interrupt anyone. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairperson Yank. Uh, just uh, for the record, forget me nots are a drought tolerant flower, FYI. Zadoria. Okay, well, thank you so much for the presentation. I'm happy that the policy was prepared. So thank you to the city manager and to, of course, you, Christine Powers. Um, I'm wondering, so I, reading the policy, what are the costs that are associated and how is that decided on? Because it does say that there are costs for the permitting and whatnot and for the applicant. What does that entail? How much would it, an estimate of that be for somebody? <clears throat> I apologize who wants to apply for a monument or a plaque? And how was that decided upon? Uh, sorry, that's my first question. Second question is that specific location, I'm wondering, is that the hidden part? So that's kind of like the lower area of the library. I'm assuming from the picture, that's what it looked like. Um, and that's already in a flower bed, it seemed like. So I was wondering why it's not kind of on the out, outer area on the concrete. Um, and then the third question was the plaque. Cause I saw on the sample, there is a plaque. What would the plaque read? Where is it from? Is it 
going to say gifted from the Consul General. Um, uh, those are just questions I had, if you can answer them. Thank you. Sure, Commissioner Zadorian. So your first question was about the, I'm sorry, if you could repeat your first question. Yeah, uh, it's about the policy. It did state yes. that there were costs associated for the yes. applicant. Yes. What were the so costs? the cost honestly would depend on what monument is going in, what site it's going in, what work would have to be done to prepare the site. Um, and so that our staff would go out and assess what those costs would be and provide those costs to the applicant. And then um, I don't have the permit fees offhand, but there were there would be whatever permit fees are associated with the installation, um, just to make sure that it's signed off by our, you know, our staff to make sure it's done in a safe uh, manner and according to code. So um, I think the costs to answer your question in a nutshell would vary. Um, depending on what's going in, where it's going in. For example, if, you know, there is going to be lighting on this monument, that would be, you know, that would involve some electrical work. And so that might increase costs, for example. Um, as far as the location, the original location was on the concrete right where those bollards are, those blue bollards. And um, that's certainly the first location, but once, folks go in to see exactly how it looks. We think we decided that it would be better in the planters and we'd remove some of those plants and make it accessible because um, when you go, there's a website dedicated to this monument in Israel and you will see that people go up to the monument and they'll put flowers around it, similar to our comfort women statue. So it wouldn't be, you know, tucked into the bushes. It would be off of the sidewalk so that the sidewalk is not blocked but it would be right there, I believe, so that people can access it, but it's not in the way. So it wouldn't be totally set back against the building. Um, and then as far as what goes on the plaque, that hasn't been proposed, but I would imagine it would be, um, you know, the name of the donor, um, the purpose, and when it was um, finally installed. Okay, thank you for answering all my questions. Or Chairperson Yank. Um, I, I think I just have one question, which is just a little bit larger process wise is um, when we receive proposals for um, just to clarify for for like donated pieces like this or pieces to be installed Glendale that the, does the city manager's office make determinations of what moves forward to the commission or do you kind of consider uh, consider each you know um, sort of pick ones that you think are appropriate and then send them forward I'm just curious how that um, the proposals come to the city manager's office and then do you do all of them come to the commission or um, or do you choose which ones to send forward? I, uh, to answer your commissioner, Chairperson Yank, you know, this is a new policy, so we'll kind of see where it goes. But I would think that the, the proposals that are serious, that we see that there, there, there is, for example, there is actually a monument or the group does have the funds um, you know, if it's if it's like an actual thing that would happen, then we would, of course, bring that forward. Um, it would be part of our process and um, we would have to bring it forward. Um, but if it's a group saying, you know, we have this idea and we don't have the funding um, and we see that at the end of the day, there is that um, agreement that they have to sign with the city um, stipulating that they'll, you know, be they have the funding to install this. Um, and they, have, they can obtain the appropriate insurance, which isn't a lot, but they would need to obtain the appropriate insurance. If they say that they can't meet those requirements, then um, then we wouldn't bring it forward. But if we see that all those pieces are in place, we would absolutely bring them forward. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, it seems like with the clarification of this policy, we there may be additional proposals that come down the line from other folks in the future. So I was just curious about that. Thank you. Um, I think the, the the other commissioners have asked all my other questions already. So um, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, so we we do have a motion um, for this one, which is to recommend 
this monument to the city council. Um, would anyone like to make a motion or have any further questions? I'll make a motion. Um, I would like to move that the Arts and Culture Commission recommends that the City Council approve the acceptance and installation of the proposed monument. Oh, before before we do the motion, um, do we do we give recommendations to Council? Is that the idea or um, is it a vote or you know, if there's any additional things we want them to consider, how do those things get passed on to city council? For instance, the base, um, which was a question I had, like what it's, what it's gonna look like and what considerations will be given to that. How, how are those passed on to the city council? Uh, Commissioner Vidor, I would say that if that is a discussion you can have amongst the commissioners and if there's consensus on that, you can make the recommendation to council to approve that with if you have specific conditions or certain things you would like to see would be part of your recommendation. Mm. Does that answer the question? Yeah, yes, you have answered my question. Thank you. So I guess do, um, before we make a motion, do any commissioners have any specific recommendations that they would like to pass along to city council and then we can we can um, discuss those. Well, I the, the only thing I had was to consider minim, um, you know, the sculptural piece speaks to something and to minimize the base so that the base doesn't disproportionately overshadow the piece. Yeah, I'm I'm in I'm in agreement with that as well. Okay. And then I would add to that that um, I think there's two different um, sketches that we received. One of them has a cone in the center and the other one shows a light. I, I think it would be nicer to have a light because it would just um, be more visible. I would agree with that to the point of lighting it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Me as well. Sure, yeah. Any Chair yes. Yanka and yes. Mr. Dismond. So you could still make the motion and, and as amended, you know, including these additional uh, recommendations. Okay. Um, so there, before you do that, Arlena, is there any, are sorry. there any, <laughs> just are there any other comments um, from Commissioner Bayar or Commissioner Zadorian? Um, anything else you might like to add to those recommendations of minimizing the base and lighting the sculpture, I think are the two main points. I have no recommendations or comments. So oh, I, I agree with your amendments. Okay. Oh, okay, so um, I will move uh, that the Arts and Culture Commission recommends that the City Council approve the acceptance and installation of the proposed monument in recognition of the Armenian Genocide by the Council General of Armenia to be located at the Central Library 222 East Harvard, uh, as outlined in the March 17th report by Library Arts and Culture's um, uh, Principal Arts and Culture Administrator, and we recommend and adding the recommendations that council consider minimizing the base of the piece um, in proper proportions, as well as um, instead of a um, pointed center in the middle of the sculpture or monument to put a light there. Is, is that okay? I'll second. Thank you, um, Commissioner. Roll call, Commissioner Tufankian. Yes. Vidor. Yes. Zadorian. Yes. Vice Chair Vyar. Yes. Chairperson Gink. Yes. Thank you so much, Christine, for joining us. We appreciate your presentation. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, Christine. Moving on to agenda item five C: Cultural Equity and Inclusion Plan Assessment Report. Motion to note and file the Cultural Equity and Inclusion Plan Assessment Report by the Aspire Group. 
Uh, we are joined today by Diane Burby, who's the principal with the Aspire Group, in addition to Naila Muid, uh, who I'm going to hand it off to both of them. Diane, are you here? Yes, thank you. I am here. Hello, commissioners, and it's great to be with you once again. And we're very happy to spend just a bit of time um, in consideration of the assessment report that we have filed. And if I could ask uh, Jennifer, how much time should we allow? We can be very efficient in respecting folks' time here. I think your anticipated approximately 10 to 15 minutes would be great. Fantastic. So I'm appreciating and hopeful that everyone has had an opportunity to uh, receive and review the report. And it was uh, just absolutely interesting, dare I say fascinating for us to go through the review of your past efforts, as well as a bit of your policies and practices in assessing um, the efforts that you have advanced forward thus far. Just very quickly to speak to what we wanted to uh, recap is what was our process for the assessment, ultimately what findings emerged and what recommendations did we bring forward. And so just to remind you, our process included a very substantial document review of past IDEA efforts, uh, and they were quite comprehensive, a lot of um, significant work over a relatively short period of time, I must say. In addition to that, we had a facilitated conversation with the administrative managers um, of the Library Arts and Culture Department, and that was absolutely uh, so tremendously valuable, tapping into not only what was done, but their insights directly from the varied individuals who had to organize, coordinate, implement, and ultimately assess that variety of activities and their candor and specificity and sharing lessons learned were substantial and will be extremely beneficial as we look at incorporating new practices and enhancements going forward. And then the final part of our process was uh, inquiry meetings, periodic meetings with a few representatives of the department, few leaders of the department who were able to answer our questions as we dug into more background and context, capacity uh, and feasibility of matters so that we had a deep enough understanding to bring forward meaningful recommendations. So as you found in the report, we summarized strengths and concerns and the strengths were just the impressive portfolio of past efforts, not just by way of volume, but variety as well as uh, being made available at multiple sites throughout the city. Uh, the different constituencies that could tap into the efforts and see them as part of what their city had to offer and even more so what their local neighborhood had to offer. Very positive. We found these to be uh, helpful to seeing that the Arts and Culture um, Commission and its work as well as the libraries actually serve as resources beyond what people traditionally think, and that's a good thing. When it comes came to some of the more complex elements, we found them to be well researched and substantiated by good uh, consideration, reflection, and confirmation of historical information 
that could then be advanced as part of a recommendation that resulted in the Sandown Town resolution, for example. Throughout the operation, the principles and practices of IDEA are at play. They are part of the thinking of leaders and staff alike, and that is a very strong sign of well integration of this work as opposed to uh, limited and uh, time specific. This is long term and fully adopted elements of thought. And that there is intentional messaging and promotion and an understanding of how important that is does occur as it related to past efforts and likely will be enhanced greatly looking at work going forward. Glendale libraries and arts and culture are well networked across our region, across our county. And those partnerships are of great value, particularly as you look at broader promotion, communication, outreach, and ultimately engagement of all that you all make available. And finally, that there is already in place ongoing meeting structures and systems of communication that are helpful to coordinating a full range of activities where the right hand truly does know what the left hand is doing and that that broader sense is reassuring and allows the public to have a notion that these are not one offs or isolated efforts, but they are part of a comprehensive and uh, full of variety offering, which is clearly positive. So where are the areas that we felt uh, raise some concern and flag for future improvement? There is certainly a need for a clear, compelling, overarching vision. And this is where the commission can play a very strong and intentional role because that, that vision doesn't change for year to year. It's ultimately why this body of work matters to you and why this collection of efforts are aligned and appropriate, valued and necessary to the fulfillment of that vision. Again, that helps internally and exponentially helps externally for people to truly appreciate and comprehend all that you are doing. We also just found that by way of capturing and documentation that protocols and practices can be put in place that really ensure the record holds both process, details, and background, both in terms of the value it is over time for new queries to truly understand what you're doing, but this is also essential when you talk about measuring progress and impact over time, capturing for benchmark purposes, what was the starting point? What was this impetus? What are the demographics of who participated? And are we seeing improvements? Are we standing steady or are we regressing? All of these items in number two, three, and four are just about practices that will only serve you well in the long term. Item five talks about outreach and promotion, and it is about continuing what you've done in the past and then building on that quite substantially. Here is an area that 2022 says that when we're talking about reaching diverse people with eclectic programming, we're also leveraging every single communication vehicle you have, but you may be leading the way even with your external partners 
to be, do more sophisticated things in leveraging the network and communication systems that they have. In other words, to ensure that they conveniently and easily provide links to your efforts and not just announcements, that there are ways of co-marketing, co-promoting that reinforce and reiterate what's available across many, many mediums, including social media to a high degree. We also found that Glendale, like every other public institution, finds itself having to deal with a digital age, but not digital proficiency with all of your end users. Consequently, you may need to take the lead, even offer technical assistance that helps to bridge that digital divide, which in turn also can be reflective of a generational divide in some cases. And that if we do not address this, we are really prone to repeating challenges around access and equity as it relates to those who can submit their work, those who will be seen in the strongest light when they do submit their work, those who can be aware and enroll and participate in your programming. This is an important one. And then finally, there was such a strong and sincere desire from the administrative leaders to not just program in a vacuum, but add to their thoughts and instincts direct input from the community. And the systems and best methods for doing that and doing that periodically have yet to be fully developed in ways that satisfy all that was described. So this is an area where the desire for more was high. And as you can see from our recommendations, we suggest speaking to those very things and we summarize them in the most brief way here. This overarching vision of what this work means what your commitment is to it, and the impact you hope it will have on the community at large is something that we would love for the Commission's voice to be represented strong. That vision then sets in place the practical implementation elements that are many and varied that staff will then build out, implement, monitor and have an ongoing culture of enhancing and improving. The technical assistance part we've referenced as well. And again, this supports access and equity in a big way. Strengthening outreach efforts will be requiring both innovation, but maybe even an investment in additional communication vehicles uh, and technology that help to meet the goals you desire. Good practice by way of documentation will work with the administrative managers and develop templates, do training, implement practices and monitor that they are being adhered to in ways that will serve you not only with the current set of folks responsible, but even as those folks uh, transition, it will be sustained in the practice of the department. And then finally, we will provide ongoing education in the IDEA space for all staff, and that will start even in the weeks ahead. We look forward to at the end of this month to also be engaging the commission in talking about strategies and approaches uh, appropriate to this first item, which is vision and impact and your contribution to establishing that overarching necessary piece. 
I want to pause at this point and entertain any questions, any feedback. Uh, I hope the report landed with clarity uh, with you and we are open to anything you want to share back to us. And thank you, Jennifer. Uh, you can take the screen down for fear that I will just blow up something if I try to do it on my end. Thank you, Diane, for that presentation. Uh, Chairperson Yang, shall I start with a uh, round of questions? Yeah, that would be great. Thanks. Okay. Vice Chair Weyer, do you have any questions? I do not, but thank you for a very thorough report. And uh, yes, it's clear. And appreciate your presentation. Look forward to seeing you at the end of the month. Okay. Commissioner Chu, thank you. Likewise, thank you for a thorough presentation. Really looking forward to working um, with you. And um, I believe you said that you would provide education for GLAC staff. Would that would it also be for us? Is there going to be any kind of like an educational uh, meeting for us as well? We're going to work a bit of education into the uh, session at the end of the month. And that's a great question because the challenge is you have Brown Act restrictions and you have larger than Brown Act desires for information. So what we're going to work out is to see if we can somehow leverage the staff sessions either by uh, allowing some engagement that doesn't have all of you and therefore doesn't compromise the standards of the Brown Act and or perhaps recorded portions of it because schedules can be busy too that makes that information available we haven't quite worked out those details but you are top of mind for us as commissioners how do we make sure you are not left out on the loop in this education circuit that we're going to be doing thank you that's it commissioner vidor uh, well, thank thank you very much, Diane. Um, I was really impressed with the report and your summary that you just gave. One of the things I loved about it uh, was that it was very specific. You know, you you identified tangible uh, strengths um, and tangible concerns that can be followed up on and resolved and. Um, you know that that's really appreciated, especially in such an important uh, subject matter. So um, that's great. I um, I was wondering if it would be possible something that used to happen in the city of Glendale, but I haven't participated in anything like this in a while. Was there used to be these things that were public meetings, uh, not televised but public, and they were called study sessions, and they would include. Um, they can include multiple people from uh, official bodies in the city to be involved in a discussion. Um, in the past, the last one I went to, which was about four years ago, included um, in one of the, the official city rooms uh, seats for an audience. People could come up and do an oral communication, but the people involved in the main discussion, which at that time included city council and some other people were, were up there talking. Um, so it was like a slightly less formal way to um, engage an entire body without the official meeting with the TV cameras and everything. So I guess I would just maybe throw it out that we could consider that approach. Um, and also, um, I was thinking while I was reading it about the fact that we're looking into and will eventually be uh, hiring a public relations firm to, um, to help get be help us with outreach, which has to be so vast in this day and age, and that that may hopefully anticipate some of the questions you had. How do you see the press, um, press um, media contacts in relationship to this? Is that something that you think is important? Is it something that um, we need to do more or less of? Are we hitting you know the, tr the correct trade publications, so to speak? Right. Um, right. Well, I think your I think your press relations are vital, both for promoting and getting information out. And I 
I know that that does not happen automatically. That is a whole series of very intentional strategies to maximize press coverage. I would also say not to be a, a dooms, you know, lifter, but it is always important for an entity to also have good press network and press relations in the event that you are responding to sensitive or challenging issues and both being responsive and owning your narrative as opposed to having it imposed upon you is going to be vital. And so uh, I imagine that you all may have gone through some prior press training as commissioners and it may not be a bad idea to do some IDEA specific press training because it will leave you in a more uh, assured or confident place of what to do and what not to get baited into doing, which we're in a challenging moment right now around that type of thing. I, I also would say that um, press being one medium, um, really huge, and your public relations uh, firm will probably equally be devoted time to both your presence and narrative and social media, which is a whole different animal, but equally impactful to owning your message, controlling your narrative. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Great. And, and thanks for noting that type of meeting. We will certainly uh, hear more from our representatives in the city about that possibility. I wasn't even aware of that format. So thank you for bringing that to our attention. It may be extinct now. I don't know. <laughs> thank you. Commissioner Zadorian. Yes, uh, thank you for that presentation. It was great to hear and see. Um, I'm actually very interested as to how you came up with this idea that we our past efforts were strong so it's nice to hear um because that's i would like to say surprising for me to hear about glendale because we do have a deep history but uh not full of you know lots of effort in my opinion into cultural diversity and inclusion so it's mm -hmm. nice to hear um especially be, for the library arts and culture uh, i do agree on the common vision um in order to have one specific outlook um, so that there isn't any questioning or doubt as to what we're trying to accomplish here. And mm -hmm. definitely on the outreach, uh, I think we've all agreed that a PR firm or some kind of better outreach and marketing is necessary for the library arts and culture in general, but specifically towards this concept uh, and focus, uh, as well as the digital and gener generational divide. That's definitely an issue that's more apparent now than ever before. Um, it's how do we reach the older and the younger generations and get them involved and educated as well. Um, so I agree with everything you said, and those are the specific things that I would like to focus on the most. Um, so thank you very, very much. It was very well done. Thank you. Very good point. And, and as you said around the past efforts, it was interesting that because of the variety, many community members found the niche that they're most interested in. So what does the next chapter look like? Cross-pollination. Beyond that niche, can we get them interested in other offerings, other cultural groundings, other neighborhoods? Can we get them to move around and not just localize? That's going to be, I don't have magic answers, but that's going to be important to the next chapter. That's perfect. Thank you. Thank you, uh, 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 Chairperson Yank. Yes, thank you so much, um, Diane and the Aspire group. It, it really was a wonderful presentation and I agree with my fellow commissioners about the specificity of the report. Um, I'm very uh, encouraged, you know, by all of the work that Glendale has been doing so far, you know, huge credit to the to the library arts and culture staff and um and to this commission you know through the years uh to be pushing this forward so um 
it's really exciting, um, but also very exciting to see the recommendations and how we can kind of level up our engagement to being really proactive um, in reaching out. And so I definitely agree with, with my fellow commissioners. I'm very interested in this vision question. And given the restrictions that we're kind of under in terms of Brown Act, how we can enter into a visioning space together, you know, that can still mm -hmm. also be public. Um, mm -hmm. So I love your suggestion, Arlene, or if there's other kind of um, formats we can deploy to get into those deeper vision conversations together, I'd love to see that happen. So thank you for those suggestions. Very, very welcome. Well, great. Um, if there's no other questions. And I think the motion is to note and file uh, the presentation given here today, if somebody would like to make that. Yes, I, Commissioner Zadorian, would like to motion, uh, I make a note and file for the Cultural Equity and Inclusion Plan Assessment Report by the Spire Group. Second. Was that com uh, Commissioner Vidor? Yes. Okay. Uh, roll call, Commissioner Stufankian? Yes. Vidor? Yes. Zadorian? Yes. Vice Chair Vyar? Yes. Chairperson Yank? Yes. Thank you so much, Diane and Naila as well for, for joining us today. We really appreciate the work that you've done. Thank, Thank you. Thank you all. Looking forward to our work ahead. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye-bye. Chairperson Yank, uh, I'm going to move it on to agenda item 6A. 2021-2022 work plan progress updates, uh, which are listed in the report as well, but I'll just briefly go through the updates that we have thus far. Uh, in regards to Art Happens Anywhere projects, we currently have, very thankful that the Blue Marble Art Collective has installed their exhibit in Pending Storms at Central Library. Um, and the exhibit will be on display through May 21st <clears throat> as part of the Earth Day and Reflect Space and Brand Library Gallery exhibits as well. Uh, the impending students exhibit does have an engagement activity, which are six by six white note cards that are available on site. And we've had very much uh, a lot of engagement with that process. We're very thankful that uh, a lot of people have participated and added their drawings to the exhibit as well. So that will be on site available for participants to enjoy and participate. We also have an update with uh, Learners Og Dance and Music Ensemble. As I mentioned before, they have re envisioned their proposal. So they're going to have a one day in person uh, celebration on the Arts Hawk Paseo on April 30th um, and include various uh, wonderful uh, musicians to celebrate that day. So that is the updates for the Art Happens Anywhere projects. Uh, in regards to the Labasse Project's RFQ, as the Commission knows, the, the Commission hosted a special meeting on March 10th to review design concepts proposal for the ArtSoc uh, ground level sculpture. The Commission reviewed three proposals and chose Tamit Gohar by Forma Studio as the first recommendation and Buddy by Ho de Souza as an alternate recommendation. So those are um, under review as well. The Commission will host a meeting on April 7th. Uh, to review design concepts for the Glen Oaks Median uh, sculpture proposals, and also on April 14th uh, at one o'clock to review design concept proposals for the Central Park ground level sculpture. Um, and we will continue to provide updates on that progress, but those are the meetings that have been scheduled thus far for the vast projects. Um, in regards to mural ordinance update, we staff is working very diligently with Sarah Odenkirk, who is our mural ordinance uh, a consultant. We're very close. We're, we're, we're um, anticipating to have a draft ready for review by, with the commission at the April meeting. So we will make sure to keep you apprised on progress of that and we will we will get there. Um, and then also the storefront art program. I'm happy to share that we um, have released uh, a application process, a request for artists, very similar to the Adams Community Park gas station, which is now available on our website. Um, and we are going to open the application process. It will be ongoing. And we're hoping to get a really good sl slate of uh, applicants for that process. So that is up in line. And then lastly, I'm going to share my screen. We had a, a artist review and selection committee. Thank you so much to Chairperson Yank and Commissioner Zadorian who joined us. Uh, staff reviewed and first staff received 116 applications for the performance art series, uh, which would feature the brand library plaza series and the 22T East concert series. So staff initially did the review for 116 applications. We met with uh, the artist review and selection committee to review those 
uh, applications and recommendations. So I'm just going to quickly go through kind of what are those recommendations for programming are for those two series. First up, we have the Brand Library Plaza series, which will take place uh, in July and August on Fridays at 7 p.m. The programming recommendations are listed here as well, but I'll also go them briefly. So Son Havana, String Harmony, Strigan and Justifia, Eva and the Vagabond Tales, Tres Souls, Zilupatin's Patio Club, Osayeros, and Dave Stucky and the Hot House Gang. So of those recommendations, I'll just briefly go through each of them. Uh, Son Habana is a Latin salsa group that would be potentially opening up the series on Fridays. Um, String Harmonies is a really fantastic, uh, I believe, trio to quartet focusing on Armenian Middle Eastern music that would also be part of the series. Dragon and Justifia are a, is a reggae funk band that would be very uh, a first time for the Brand Library Plaza series, which we're very excited about. Even the Vagabonds are a pop um, uh, ensemble that has obviously performed at Downtown Disney and have done a fantastic job with uh, their ensemble of music. Um, up next is Tres Souls, who have actually performed at the, the Ford Theater and have done lots of focus on Latin and bolero music, which would be a beautiful night at the, the Bren Library. Uh, Z. Lupitin's Badio Club is actually uh, an ensemble. Zachary Lupitin is the leader of a larger ensemble called the Dust Bowl Revival. They focus on uh, folk Americana music, which will be a really fun evening at the brand. Uh, Osayeros is a samba Brazilian group that has also performed at various locations throughout the county. That'll be a great night at the, at the brand. And we were, are potentially closing with Dave Stuckey and the Hot House Gang, which is a jazz swing ensemble. So those are the programming recommendations for the brand. Up next, uh, we also discussed the 222 East Concert Series, which are potentially taking place in October on Saturdays at 5 p.m. at the Artsakh Paseo. The recommendations are the Big Better Jazz Band, Sasa Caliente, Gagas, Joshua De Leon, and Yuko Mabuchi. And I'll go through those uh, as well. Uh, programming recommendations would be to have the Big Butter Jazz Band uh, open the series. Big Butter Jazz Band has performed at the Brand Library Plaza series before with great success. So we think they would be a, a slam dunk op opener for the 222 East Concert Series. Salsa Caliente as well has previously performed at the Brand Library, I think with the record um, concert attendance of I think 450 attendees who attended at the Brand Library for their performance. So we're, we're hoping there'll be a big draw to the series. Joshua De Leon is a, a young artist who's up and coming, does um, pop music that we think will be a great addition to the series. Um, Gagas is, is also focused on Armenian Middle Eastern music. I think they're a trio as well, or possibly more. Um, that would be a great addition to the series. And to close it out would be Yuko Mabuchi, who is a pretty well-known jazz pianist, who has had a lot of success as well. So we're hoping this slate of artists will bring a, a large draw to the Chuchu Cheese concert series. So we're very excited about the, the recommendations that the, the commission has approved. Um, and uh, I, I'll hand it off actually to Commissioner Zadorian or Chairperson Yank, if you have any comments or uh, about the process or the artists. Um, I'm just, oh, go ahead. go ahead. I was just going to say, as you guys can see, it's a very eclectic group of artists for both Brand and 222 East. And it was not hard to make the decision. Um, one, because Jennifer made it easy and so did Yvonne. However, everyone is talented and everyone seemed really interesting. I think for live performances, these were the perfect ensembles for everybody to enjoy over the summer. So I hope you all agree and that uh, we can all see it and enjoy. I know that we haven't really had these because of COVID. So it's a great thing to look forward to. And I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I hope you guys are too. Yeah, likewise, it was really fun to um, select these artists and uh, the staff made it incredibly easy for us because they have, you know, they curated a wonderful selection of um, groups. Uh, I think it will really um, you know, enliven uh, both of those series, kind of bring them back in full force. So I'm really, really excited. Thank you. We, re we really appreciate the commission's um, engagement on this committee as well. Um, but lastly, I just wanted to share some news as well that um, as of yesterday, unfortunately, we found out that Barbara Morrison, who is a fantastic, real jazz legend in the community, has passed away. Um, Barbara, in this other photo here, has performed previously at the Brand Library Plaza series in 2018, was a force of nature, really fantastic, wonderful musician. We're, it's a big loss to the jazz, the music community in, in general. Um, but we just wanted to thank her and honor her uh, for her contributions and especially her contributions to the Brand Library Plaza series. 
Um, so that concludes the report for the uh, updates. Uh, shall I move it on, Commissioner uh, yes. Chairperson Yink? Yes. Uh, thank you. Agenda item seven, commission staff comments. Shall I go in line of order? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Vice Chair Viar, any commission staff comments? Um, no, just thanks a million for all of your work. I can see you've been very busy and thanks to the commissioners uh, for this great um, music program, the uh, series. Um, and tell Ivana that, Ivana that we said thank you to Jennifer, please. <laughs> <laughs> Ivana is managing the public comment call, so she she hears you and, and appreciates okay, you. Okay, good. <laughs> <I'll do. laughs> thank, thank you all very much. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner to thank you. Thanks a million is right. And it's such an exciting time to be in the arts in Glendale. And there's so much going on, so many new projects. And it's really, really exciting. And Jennifer and um, Dr. Schaefer, you guys are doing an incredible job. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and it's great to see that the music series is going to start up again. And um, really looking forward to that. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Commissioner Vidor. Well, ditto. I think uh, you know, reading reading the Aspire report, uh, it wasn't surprising to see their uh, uh, assessment of what's going on. Um, anytime I'm someplace where I can sing the praises of library arts and culture for all they're doing, uh, and really leading the way in the IDEA area. Uh, for the city, um, I do because you know I can only hope that the entire world gets to experience what uh, the the embarrassment of riches that we have here uh, in the city with respect to cultural programs and uh, programming related to diversity and equity. So uh, thanks to the entire staff, uh, library arts and culture leadership, and my fellow commissioners. I can't wait for the music program. Looking forward to that. Um, so, um, really, thank you so much. I did want to make a comment because it came up before the meeting and I, I just feel compelled um, to say something about it because it's weighing heavily on my mind and it has to do with the RFP for the um, uh, crosswalk program that was the first agenda item. And um, my concern about that, um, even though it wasn't agendized today, is that the uh, color palette that has been mandated by Public Works uh, to include in that is very, very restrictive. Uh, um, and uh, no cities, very few, if any cities, actually adhere to the color palette that is outlined as a recommendation in the Department of Transportation uh, manual. Uh, in fact, if you look at, for instance, Bloomberg Philanthropies, which now has uh, funded no less than 42 cities to put in artful and colorful crosswalks. Um, it is, seems to be universally recognized that boldness of color uh, and pattern slows traffic down and enhances pedestrian safety. Um, we have, uh, as we all know, I think a very challenging traffic situation here. Uh, Glendale is known for having uh, adventuresome driving and pedestrian activities and um, you know, it, it seems to me as though more um, attention needs to be paid at crosswalks than our people are being paid and that colorful, uh, bold and artful um, uh, art on the street is a way to do that. So um, I was extremely disappointed to see that being mandated in the RFP and um, you know, I hope that at some point we can discuss that as a commission and maybe be able to meet with our colleagues uh, across the departments to understand uh, the rationale for that when all other cities seem to have abandoned it. Um, so that that's basically all I have to say. Thank you. Commissioner Sadori. Yes, I was going to introduce myself. Um, I actually wholeheartedly agree with Commissioner Vidor. I have the exact same comments. I do believe that uh, moving forward with the RFP that we do, let me see exactly how this would be. We would be to, one second, exclude the clause on the MUTCD standards 
uh, which are restrictive, as Commissioner Vidor stated. It also wouldn't even allow for the ones that currently went in, the tester crosswalks that we see around Glendale right now, they wouldn't even fall into those standards. So I do agree. I, I think that we should have that reviewed and taken out as a clause, um, as other cities have done, including Santa Monica, Los Angeles, was Hollywood and others. So I agree with wholeheartedly, and I hope uh, Chair Yank, you agree as well, and we can Moving forward, when we do agendize this conversation, that clause can be taken out. Uh, and this comes from one, my own opinion, but as well as many others in the community contacting me in regards to this issue. So thank you very much. Chairperson Yank. I think um, because two commissioners have, have spoken on this, um, I guess my comment would be um, to, to take it to staff to consider to agendize this for the future. Um, Personally, I I think that um, because this is a cross-departmental collaboration, I want to be very sensitive to that, you know, and I think us having um, a good working relationship and aligning with public works in terms of what will work for them and what will work for us will be uh, a good conversation to have moving forward. Um, so hopefully we can address that in a, in a collegial way um, to see Maybe not for this current RFP, because as I understand, the timeline is very tight, but uh, for for future um, future RFPs, that this can be something that we can align on uh, in the future and really understand where both departments are coming from. Uh, so that's, that's my comment on it. We do have um, Director Schaefer as well on the line uh, representing staff and uh, also Sarkis Oanyasian, who's the Acting Deputy Director from Public Works, if either of you would like to add comments. Uh, I would first ask uh, Sarkis if he has comments. Um, yeah, good afternoon, um, Chairperson Yank and members of the Commission. Um, like you guys, I just wanted to say we are excited to take on a new creative and fun type projects. And we are aware of the concerns, suggestions, um, and the recommendations, uh, and we will look into the matter to see if there's any way of achieving achieving it. Thank you. Look forward to working with you. Yeah. Thank you, Sarkis. You're welcome. Director Schaefer. And my only comment is actually on another matter, which is, uh, I would hope the commission might consider closing the meeting in honor of Barbara Morrison. That's all. Thank you. I was at that concert and uh, it was memorable. I have pictures from it and she was truly a force of nature. Very sad to hear of her passing. Thank you. Um, do we have any additional commission staff comments? I don't think so. Okay. Um, I will move on to agenda item eight, which is written communications. We did receive, I believe, three written communications in regards to agenda item 5A. Um, I did forward those on to the commission. This one that just came in, I did not, obviously, uh, being in the meeting. But I will just share briefly the same um, uh, sentiment that Commissioner Vidor and Commissioner Zadorian has shared in regards to the color palette for these creative crosswalks. We did receive a uh, written communication from Kathy Frenda. Uh, I will not go into reading the exact verbiage as you all have the, the, the written communication in front of you, but has also expressed um, specifically in regards to the, the color palette, how, how the, the specific area of Glendale has, as we mentioned, difficulties in, in, in wanting to accentuate pedestrian and driver safety, um, and that it would be great to incorporate eye-catching uh, improve, improvements to the pedestrian safety by uh, interacting and having more colors uh, in, incorporated into the creative crosswalks um, from Kathy Renda. Uh, you can all read the written communication, as I mentioned earlier. The second written communication we have is from Alec Bartrasouf, who is a... Um, uh, private citizen representing um, this particular the uh, written communication, but is also uh, the chair on the city's sustainability commission, and also is specifically in regards to agenda item five a rejecting the clause that mentions the MUTC uh, MUTCD guidelines that severely restrict the type of artwork that can be done on asphalt art as part of decorative artwork uh, cro uh, crosswalks, um, and is requesting to consider the 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 the, the flexibility of the colors. 
for the creative crosswalks as well. So that communication is what is available to you as well. After the meeting, I can forward you the last communication that just came in from Gray James of Glendale Out, who basically reiterated the same sentiments as the previous written communication. Um, so those are the written communications for today. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. And agenda item, um, if I may, uh, Chairperson Yank agenda item uh, nine, adjournment. And as we mentioned before, we would like to close the meeting in honor of Barbara Morrison and all of her contributions to the, to the city and the county. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, yes, we officially close the meeting and, um, and do so on behalf of the commission uh, in honor of Barbara Morrison and her contributions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Oh.